whenever we talk to the communities, we're like, your health and the gorilla's health depends on each other. And we don't just say that, you know, the gorillas are more important than the people, because that's a mistake that a lot of conservationists make. We say that when you improve your health, the gorillas fall sick less often, you can benefit more from them from tourism. And you have a, you also, when you improve your health, you spend less money on healthcare when you improve your hygiene and you have a, a better quality of life for your family. And that's the same argument we've used for family planning. It's like, if you have the number of children you can manage, then it means you don't have to rely so much to, on the forest to meet your basic needs. And these children can all go to school. They can get jobs and they don't have to go to the forest to survive. They can be teachers, doctors, nurses, you know, vets, park rangers, and then you broke in the poverty cycle. And so it's all about telling people that, you know, when they improve their health, when they manage their families better, they have a better quality of life. And in, the, in turn, the wildlife is better off and they can benefit more from the wildlife. Nature Solutionaries is a podcast about conservationists who do amazing things for nature and bring inspiration into our lives. Hi, welcome back to Nature Solutionaries, a podcast about conservation, feminism and sustainable population. This time I'm speaking with Gladys Kalema Zikusoka, one of the leading conservationists and scientists working to save the critically endangered mountain gorillas of East Africa. Gladys started her career as a Ugandan first wildlife veterinarian. Her research in the transmission of diseases between humans and gorillas led her to co-found Conservation Through Public Health in 2003 an NGO that promotes the coexistence of endangered mountain gorillas, among other wildlife, as well as humans and livestock. For her outstanding environmental and humanitarian work, Gladys has received a number of awards from the United Nations, Sierra Club, and Edinburgh International Science Festival. Her work has been featured on BBC and National Geographic and her memoir, Walking with Gorillas, The Journey of an African Wildlife Vet, came out in March 2023. Gladys, it's such an honor to have you on my podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast, Veronica. Gladys, you work in Bindi Impenetrable National Park in Uganda, which is home to half of the world's population of mountain gorillas. The good news is that the population has been rising steadily since 1997. It must be an amazing place to work for any nature buff, so you're very lucky. I'm wondering, what made you fall in love with gorillas? Oh, <laughs> I've been working with mountain gorillas for a long time, I'd say all my working life, over 25 years. And I'll say what made me fall in love with the gorillas is having visited them as a vet student in 1994 and meeting them and really connecting. Cause the very first time I saw the mountain gorillas, I actually only saw one gorilla because for some reason, the rest of his group wasn't with him. He was called Kachupira cause he had a broken hand. And I really felt a deep connection. And then I spent a whole month in the forest collecting fecal samples to look at parasites and bacteria in the mountain gorillas. It made me realize how few they were at the time. There were only 650 and how endangered they were. And I really felt at that point that I wanted to be a vet who also works, who actually works full time with the mountain gorillas and other wildlife. So it was a turning point in my life, spending a month in the forest as a vet student. And really, I'll say that was, that's what made me fall in love with the mountain gorillas. It must have been an incredible experience to come into close contact with these amazing species. You also mentioned that you started your career as a wildlife veterinarian. In fact, you were the first wildlife vet in Uganda. Most vets I know here treat cats and dogs, and I have a Finnish friend who treats cows and horses. <laughs> I'm really curious about what a normal day in the life of a wildlife vet looks like. The normal day in the life of a wildlife vet is not typical. 
<laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> it's not typical. I know I trained on dogs and cats and cows and horses in the UK. I went to the Royal Veterinary College, University of London. And so starting out as Uganda's first wildlife vet was a bit daunting for me, but very exciting. One thing that I found is, first of all, having to convince people that you have to treat a wild animal when it's sick was a big thing because they, weren't, they were used to wild animals being left on their own. And if it gets old or it's sick, it's the next meal for the lion or it's time for the animal to die. But and everything was, every, everybody's thinking was just about natural selection. But the fact that human beings have encroached on their habitat, people are entering the park and setting snares, and now they're exposed to human diseases and especially closely related great apes, it was necessary to have veterinary care. And so my typical day wasn't only about treating the animals, but also about educating people on why it's important to treat them, um, educating local communities not to get too close, educating tourists not to get too close, um, writing proposals because it was a new department in Uganda Wildlife Authority. It was, it was actually wasn't a typical day. And I realized that as a wildlife vet, you end up wearing very many hats um, beyond treating the animals alone. And so it's, yeah, it's a very exciting time. You must be a versatile person because as you mentioned, you work on a lot of things and with different animals. And I can imagine that having this know-how was also very useful for starting your own organization, which we'll talk about later. But before that, I would also like to touch on the close coexistence between gorillas, people and livestock. Conservationists and tourists trek in the Bindi National Park and local people look for food and natural resources in the park. Sometimes the primates also visit villages to feed on farmers' crops where they meet livestock. So what are the threats of living closely with gorillas? Before gorillas were habituated for tourism, the biggest threat was habitat loss because people didn't see the use of the gorillas, so they kept cutting the forest habitat because they needed firewood and they needed to enter the park to poach, to eat daikar and bush pig. That part of Uganda, people never don't eat gorillas. In fact, the hunter-gatherers who used to live in the park, the Batwa, it was, it was bad luck to look in the eyes of a gorilla. So before tourism, the biggest threat to the gorillas was habitat loss and caused also by high human population growth right up to the edge of the park. But once the gorillas got habituated for tourism and people couldn't enter anymore to cut trees, the next threat to gorillas became disease because now you could get very close to them. You had to get close enough to them in order to have tourists visit them and researchers. And because we're so closely related to each other, we share over 98% genetic material can, and can easily make each other sick. The gorillas were now exposed to diseases from people. And also not only diseases from people who visited them, but also diseases from people when they ranged outside the park boundaries to eat people's banana plants or to eat the bark of the eucalyptus trees that people were encouraged to plant so they don't have to enter the forest to collect firewood. And the reason they moved out is because their forest habitat had been cut. And now that they had lost their fear of people, they could go back and range in places that they used to range before. And so disease now has become one of the biggest threats to the gorillas. That's really interesting. I didn't know that gorillas shared 98% of our DNA. I'm wondering what kind of illnesses can they get from people? The common flu, because you don't have to get very close to them to spread flu to them, um, and COVID. And that's why when you visit the gorillas, there's a regulation that you have to be a certain distance away from them, even as you visit as a tourist or a researcher. One of the first diseases wasn't from the tourists, but was from the local communities because gorillas tend to range outside the park. And, you know, I got a report that the gorillas are losing hair and developing white scaly skin. And it seemed to be scabies. And when I spoke to a human doctor friend of mine, I asked her, what is the most common skin disease in people? She said scabies, because low income groups of people in Uganda tend to have less than adequate hygiene, and they tend to have diseases like scabies. Unfortunately, the baby gorilla died, but we managed to treat the rest of the group with ivermectin and they recovered. And of course, we started to ask ourselves, where could this have come from? Looking around, many people had scabies in the community. You know, they weren't washing 
bathing often or washing their clothes often. And this is partly because they don't have access to clean water. And also partly lack of education where people, they had to understand that you have to be healthy, clean and hygienic, not to pick up diseases like scabies or even, you know, intestinal diseases, typhoid, cholera and things like that. And so we found that in order to prevent disease between the people and the gorillas, we had to start improving community health and community hygiene. So that was a very, that was a turning point in my life, actually, when I realized we also have to start improving the health of the local communities if we had to be able to protect the gorillas and enable them to thrive. And even improve the life of the local people, right? Yes. The livelihood part came in after we started the NGO and I realized that that's also something that we needed to address as well. The COVID lockdown had a very negative impact on the park. I was reading that before the pandemic, tourism made up 7.7% of Uganda's GDP and Bundi alone brought in $2 million dollars monthly and accounted for 60% of Uganda Wildlife Authority's revenue. But due to the pandemic, all the safari lodges, tour companies and souvenir shops closed down. Are there other ways for people to make money than from tourism? Because this thing, this pandemic can happen again, whether it's COVID or something else, so that people are more equipped for hard times and not dependent on tourists. Yes, the pandemic was a big wake up call that tourism is not the only way to provide sustainable financing for conservation. And as much as Windy National Park was, Bini Pentrobo National Park was a role model and was a best practice model for how ecotourism can work, because communities were benefiting so much from tourism um, that they couldn't even think of harming the gorillas. But the pandemic was a wake up call that, you know, you can't just rely on tourism because A lot of them had given up what they used to do before. A lot of them used to survive by farming and selling their produce. But then when tourism started, they could make more money in a day carrying somebody's luggage to the gorillas than they would digging in the garden all day for one month. So they're like, well, I might as well just be a porter or sell crafts. So tourism was much more lucrative. And people stopped doing what they used to do to survive before tourism began and only focused on tourism. So suddenly when it disappeared overnight, they were stuck because the money from tourists was even being used to buy food. And people were starving and poaching really increased and not only in Buindi, but all over Africa. And so this made us all realize that tourism is not the only, you you can't, it's dangerous to just rely on tourism. And as you said, it's COVID, next time it could be something else. Um, And so, One thing that we found out during the pandemic is that as much as the main market for our coffee farmers was the gorilla trekking tourists or other tourists coming into Uganda, you know, we were stuck because we could only, the money that we we made by selling them coffee is what we'd use to buy more coffee from the farmers. And that kept farmers out of the park. And now suddenly they had disappeared overnight. So we looked for markets outside Uganda and we got a very good buyer in the UK, Manero Beans. So in the US, we re- revitalized the buyer there, John, um, and he, he even renamed his website to call it gccoffeeusa.com for specifically for the part where he's selling coffee. And then we've also got buyers in New Zealand and also those are the three most consistent, but other people have started to get interested again and we're beginning to sell coffee in Australia and other places as well. So that's one way that you could keep people going and not rely on tourism only. But then there are also other ways, you know, like that, like for example, the ready to grow when we started to provide fast growing seedlings, we told the local community, this is not just for COVID, but even after COVID ends and tourists come back, you still need to keep having food. So even when the tourists come, the money from tourism shouldn't be to buy food, should be to, to spend, you know, to maybe pay for school fees or other needs, but not your most basic need which is addressing hunger. So what we've encouraged them to do is to get the seedlings from one season, have them for the next season, and just go back to what they used to do before tourism began, but do it in a more sustainable way through proper soil and water conservation. It makes sense to diversify your income. And as we say here in the Czech Republic, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, but in different baskets. Yes. We touched on 
livelihoods, which is very important. Another pillar um, that you focus on is public health. And I'm really interested in that. Conservation through public health works with local community volunteers to promote the health and well-being of the human populations living around Windy National Park. What have these volunteers achieved so far in terms of infectious disease prevention and education about hygiene practices and nutrition? Ever since we started the program, they've really improved community hygiene. When we started out, only about 10% of people had like a hand washing station outside their toilet. And now it's gone up to 75%, especially in the homes which are most visited by the village health and conservation teams. Um, people are drinking bold water. They are using drying racks. And there's, we're finding that, you know, there's less open defecation in the garden. So even when gorillas go to people's gardens, they won't find that people are openly defecating because the, the lattering usage is now over 90%. So this has all helped. This has helped the communities to be more healthy and hygienic and the gorillas to be more healthy. And so which whenever we talk to the communities, we're like, your health and the gorillas' health depends on each other. And we don't just say that you know, the gorillas are more important than the people because that's a mistake that a lot of conservationists make. We say that when you improve your health, the gorillas fall sick less often. You can benefit more from them from tourism. And you have a, you also, when you improve your health, you spend less money on healthcare when you improve your hygiene and you have a, a better quality of life for your family. And that's the same argument we've used for family planning. It's like, if you have the number of children you can manage, then it means you don't have to rely so much on the forest to meet your basic needs. And these children can all go to school and you can break the poverty cycle because now they can get jobs and they don't have to go to the forest to survive. They can be teachers, doctors, nurses, you know, vets, park rangers, and then you've broken the poverty cycle. And so it's all about telling people that, you know, when they improve their health, when they manage their families better, they have a better quality of life and in the in turn the wildlife is better off and they can benefit more from the wildlife so it's it's you have to explain it in that way and then people get convinced and they they're able to change their behavior so we have a flip chart that we use that has a family that's not doing things so well like we, we call them the bad family <laughs> and the good family it's actually called shaming and it works really well in developing countries and, you know, you show the family that's doing things all wrong and they're all suffering, suffering and struggling. And then you show the family that's, you know, manage, having four children instead of 10 or 11. Um, they're more in control of their destiny. You know, the children are going to school. They're having a balanced diet. They're not um, having to enter the forest to poach. When the gorillas come out, they call out the gorilla guardians to herd them back, whereas the first family has got it all wrong. The mom has 11 kids, she's too pregnant. Half the kids go to school, the other half are purchasing wildlife from the garden. There's human wildlife conflict. Um, the father has to go into the forest to poach. His children are caught poaching, they're arrested. There's teenage pregnancies, the children die early. And they're miserable family, there's domestic violence. So you ask the community, which one would you rather be? And a lot of them, obviously, more, all of them would rather be the nice, fam the good family that's not struggling. And so it's, it's a method that we've used and has enabled, uh, resulted in a lot of behavior change. And how many people are we talking about that you have addressed? We're talking about close to 7,000 households. And in the first 2,500 households where we've been implementing the PHE program, the Integrated Population Health and Environment Program since 2007, we found that Women, we started off when only 22% of women were using modern family planning, and it went up to 67%, which is threefold. And it was, we started off lower than the country average of 30% in rural areas, which went up to 45% in rural areas. So we're very excited that women have really embraced family planning. Um, and now we, we extended the program to additional, you know, 4,500 households, and they're all beginning to realize the same benefits. We're working with 270 village health and conservation teams, and they're able to reach 7,000 households, which, which amounts to about 40,000 people. 
How do local Ugandans view family planning? Um, I would say that it's a bit of a controversial topic, <laughs> <laughs> just like conservation is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my whole podcast is about controversial topics, conservation, feminism, sustainable population. <laughs> it is because they're trying to say, oh, you want us to reduce the number of children so the wildlife can have more land or you want us to suffer, you know, it can, it can turn into that kind of debate. But it depends on how you present it. We presented it in a way that family planning is reducing the poverty in your home. So the men understood, ah, oh, it's a better way for me to balance my family budget. And for the women, they were like, I want to have more control over my body. I don't want to have a baby every year. I want to be able to have some time to do something else in my life. You know, start a business or just... And it's better, they, they're much healthier, of course. It's better for maternal health. So it's like, but when we talk to them, we talk to them together. And so that the fathers realize, the men realize that, you know, if I want to reduce poverty in my home, I should have the children I can manage. And then the women are like, not only can we have the children we can manage, but I'm healthier and I have more control over my body. So that's the argument, that, that's, that's the debate and the, the message that we take across. And a lot of people buy into that because a lot of women want to feel liberated. They just don't want to have a baby every single year. They're much happier now that they don't have to have, to have a baby every year. So I'd say that as controversial as it is, it's the way that you present it. And I think because the PHE approach in, also incorporates health, you know, and we show them that we care about their health and healthcare is a basic human right. So by improving access to healthcare, improving community health, they're more likely to embrace family planning and they're more likely to embrace conservation. And so I think health is the area that has really can bring a lot of support for conservation by improving the health of the communities. I imagine that most of the people living around Bundy National Park are Christians, right? Yes, most of them are Christians, but even the Muslims have embraced family planning as well. Okay, okay, because I know that the Catholic Church is opposed to contraception, so I'm wondering whether some people were having objections to using contraception because of their religious views, or how did you work with that? The Catholic Church, I know, were opposed to using contraception, but even the priests in the Catholic Church, when you speak to them, they realize that there's so much poverty and people are really struggling just to survive. You know, people fight, were fighting over land, you know, and even killing each other, land wrangles. There just wasn't enough land for the people and there were, the resources weren't enough for everyone. And so the Catholic Church realized that just for people to be happier and live in harmony, family planning is a very good thing to embrace. So what we do is we speak to the religious leaders and in their congregation on Sundays, they talk about the benefits of have, using contraceptive, the benefits of family planning. And so that's another important route that we used, talking to the religious leaders because they have a lot of influence over their congregation. And that really helped. And even in a country like um, DRC, because we've done some work in DRC as well, um, it's largely Catholic in DRC. But even they embrace the family planning program because they just want to reduce poverty in their homes. Of course, it's about poverty and food security. Family planning addresses both of these issues. Now, I have a little personal question. What is your personal approach to family planning? Was your family open to it? Did you have any misconceptions in the beginning or how did you overcome them? I've never had a problem with family planning at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was lucky. Yeah, I, I, my family has never been opposed to it. And I, my husband wasn't opposed to it. We planned the children before we got married. We're like, how many children are we going to have? And that's the same message we take to the local communities. In fact, we tell them that they themselves, the village health and conservation teams, have to be role models if they want other people to adopt family planning. You know, you can't tell someone, you know, have the children you can manage when you have 10 kids and you're, on, you're pregnant again. And I say, look, you're not even practicing family planning, you know. But some of our village health and conservation teams will tell you, I had 10 children and I regret it, you know. I've really struggled to keep them going and I really advise you not to have 10 children. And others are like, you know, I just have three children and I'm using this contraceptive or that contraceptive, maybe the implant or I'm on the Depo Provera. And then, you know, they have to also practice what they preach. 
And that's what makes it easier. And for me, I have, we have two boys. <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting is I spaced them the same way as we should be spacing children. And where did I learn about that? I learned about it from the gorillas. Oh, The gorillas and chimpanzees space their children. The gorillas space their children four to five years apart. And the chimpanzees around five years apart. And this is very logical because then the older baby is already independent by the time you have the second one. And he's building his own nest and he can help mom to babysit the younger one. And he's emotionally independent. So there's less fighting between them and all both of them develop in a you know healthy way. So we tried it with our two boys, my husband and I, and I think it works. <laughs> That's super interesting. <laughs> I was reading somewhere that hunters and gatherers also used spacing and the fertility of hunters and gatherers was not as high as the fertility of sedentary civilization. That's that's really interesting about the hunter-gatherers. I've never heard that before. Thanks. I'll read up more about it, but I think it's the most logical. Don't you think so? Um, and and I, what happens is the gorillas breastfeed for three years. Um, and I think as human beings, we're supposed to breastfeed for three years and not give our children anything else. So then the hormones work in the right way. And then you don't get pregnant. And then after three years, you can conceive. But it could also be that they also did it, the hunter-gatherers, for logical purposes. You know, maybe they also up, had a bit of abstinence. I'm not sure um, what, whether they added abstinence as well. But for the great apes, that's how it works. You know, basically they breastfeed for three years. And of course, they don't supplement their babies with anything because they're in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with us, you know, you breastfeed, then you give them other baby food and different kinds of things and, you know. And many women don't even breastfeed that long anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, for people who can abstain or for people for whom the breastfeeding doesn't work, there is contraception and family planning. And um, Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> family planning has been recognized as one of the most effective health and development investments. Because as you highlighted before, it reduces poverty, decreases pressure on the environment and improves the health and welfare of women. I've read that the Ugandan population is growing by 3% per year currently. In that context, how is family planning perceived, not just in Bindi, but in Uganda? In Uganda, I would say that family planning is becoming more and more acceptable. Um, right from the top leadership, you know, the president of Uganda, I, I attended the family planning conference where, I think it was in 2014, where the president said family planning is good. He said it for the first time. Um, he said because it's, but it has to be done in connection with good education, good health care and provision of jobs. But he basically said it was a very important intervention and just getting that go ahead from the top leadership already made people then realize it's a good thing to do. Because the president of Madagascar became a real champion for family planning. And he started to re people started having s smaller family sizes. So it's really, there has to be leadership right from the top and all the various levels have to embrace family planning. And in, I know in Uganda it's 3%. At one point it was even higher. Um, and for example, in Kanungu district where we do most of our work, it's bordering Winnie Pentropo National Park, that it has the the fertility rate of women is four point seven, um, or is it four point two or seven? It's around four, and it used to be higher. It used to be about seven. So I was very very excited and you know honoured when the district health officer said to us, "Conservation to public health, your work is in, has contributed to the fertility rate in Kanungu dropping from seven to 4.2, I was so excited. I was like, wow, the work we're doing around Gwindi is really helping. So it, that means that women are no longer, you know, it used to be seven children per woman, but now it's coming down to four. And so you're seeing those gains over time. And we hope that it will pick up in the rest of the country, um, showing how it's worked in one part of the country and how people's lives are so much better. Hopefully it will spread to other parts of the country where people are still having very many children. 
it's great that you have such a huge impact and it's even measurable. I mean, many organizations are doing work and it's really hard to count it, but, but you can see the numbers. That's that's awesome. We're very excited actually when he, he told us that. And I, that district is doing so well. It was the best in COVID vaccinations, was the best in, in everything, a lot of things. It's a very progressive district, so we're lucky. <laughs> and speaking of gorillas, we mentioned them in the beginning, the close coexistence, the threats and how people are benefiting from the tourism and how you're educating them about the hygiene. How about the gorillas? You started the organization in 2003. So can you tell us a bit more about what you have achieved in terms of gorilla protection? We've found that over time, as the health and hygiene status of the communities is improving, gorillas are feeling sick less often from diseases in the local community. Um, we also find that people are much more willing to tolerate gorillas in their gardens because they're getting a benefit from being next to the gorillas. And the conservationists are showing that we also care about them and their health and their well-being. And we're not only concerned about the wildlife and the forest. So they're much more tolerant and of gorillas in their gardens and they protected some, you know, and not killed them because they they're happier. They're more willing to coexist with the gorillas. So that's something else that we're finding. And also we're finding that people are poaching less because we're able to give them food. Um, I mean, fast growing seedlings, not food, but fast growing seedlings. And we're also able to buy their coffee and give them a good price for good coffee. So we're finding through our approach, the gorillas are getting sick less often and they're being protected better by the local communities and their habitat is being destroyed less. I admire how you're able to connect the dots and find synergies between work on conservation, public health and sustainable population. And I'm really grateful that we could discuss your work in depth. Gladys, thanks a lot for sharing your personal story of how you founded conservation through public health and for letting us know about mm -hmm. the great work that the whole team and volunteers are doing. It was a pleasure talking to you. It's a pleasure talking to you to Veronica. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy reading Walking with Gorillas. And please visit our website, ctph.org, for more information on our work. If you want to learn more about conservation through public health, check out the link in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. It means a lot to me. If you liked today's episode about integrated approaches to saving our planet, I'd like to encourage you to start a conversation today about this topic with your partner, friend or colleague. Do you think that One Health approach is a good idea? If so, why? What do you appreciate about this approach and how can it get even better? There is nothing more powerful and life-changing than having a profound discussion. And of course, I'll be happy if you spread the word about my podcast on social media and subscribe to the podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Well, that might be quite a lot of tasks already, so just pick whatever feels best for you. In the next episode, I'm going to interview Oasis Sahel, an organization that advances education and reproductive choice for women and girls in the Sahel region. For more information, visit veronikaperkova.com slash podcast. I'm Veronika Perkova and I look forward to talking to you soon.